Welcome back to the podcast on Binding the Bible. This is episode 93, Revelation, a Feast of Well-Aged Wine. And the following is a sermon that I preached January 20th, 2019, from John chapter 2, where Jesus, at a wedding in Cana, turns water into wine. And I've decided to insert it here because of episode 92, our very last episode, where we looked at some of the imagery regarding the people of God spoken about as a bride or as a pure virgin, and how the New Testament often uses language of bridegroom in discussing God or then ultimately Jesus, and then how the church itself, the people of God, are spoken about as his bride. And so it's not coincidental That in the book of John, while Jesus is attempting to reveal himself to the people, the very first time he does a public sign, the very first time he gives public significance to who he is, it takes place at a wedding where he in fact honors the bridegroom at the wedding by providing the best wine for the end of the party. And I alluded to this passage a bit in last week's episode, and so I wanted to insert it here, not because I'm saying anything profound or because this sermon is particularly convicting, but because it ties together some themes for us that we oftentimes don't consider. And so I want to show you how Jesus here begins us in John chapter 2 by making the connection between wine and his own blood. And you'll see this, or you'll hear this rather, as you listen to the sermon. But the reason why I want to point this out is that we often think about this connection, the wine and his blood, when we participate in communion in our local churches. But I also want us to keep the sacramental and metaphorical imagery active in our imaginations when we approach these next several chapters of the book of Revelation, particularly chapters 14 through 18, Because it uses wine and blood imagery to speak of oppression and violence. And we've seen this already in Revelation chapter 6 and then in Revelation chapter 7 where the unfolding of the four seals conquering, leading to bloodshed, leading to oppression and and, uh, famine, which leads to death, versus Jesus conquering leading to bloodshed, but shedding of his own blood, which leads to hunger and thirst being satisfied, which leads to life. And so the New Testament already picks up quite a bit of theme regarding how wine, which can be a celebratory element, as we will see at the feast in the wedding at Cana, which is a projection forward from a a very rich Old Testament passage from the book of Isaiah, but that wine also is something that is going to be indicative of judgment and of wrath and of those who have feasted, if you will, under the oppression of other people will then be asked to drink a mixture of their own making, which will be God's unfolding wrath upon their very actions. And so Jesus as a person, Jesus as the Son of God, Jesus as the Son of Man, brings those themes together into his own self. And we're going to see that, and I'm trying to help us understand who Jesus is, what he has come to do, and why it is so significant for helping us reorient the way we think about both oppression and blessing, violence and compassion. And Jesus wraps them both up into himself. And I think again, as Revelation 19.10 tells us, that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's important for us to realize now, especially as we come into these very intense passages of judgment that are portrayed in the book of Revelation, that we keep in mind ultimately how this is revealing Jesus to us. And so I thought it would be good to insert this sermon for us to keep in tension both the idea of wine as blessing and wine as feasting, which it still has connotations of that in our society today, but also the fact that throughout Revelation, wine will be spoken about in terms of judgment and wrath 
as a result of oppression and violence that has actually happened to certain people. And if you keep those themes in mind as you listen and you keep those themes in mind as you read, we can very safely conclude that there are some people in this world whose feasting and celebration and lavish lifestyles come at the expense of other people, which is precisely why God's wrath and God's blessings can both be spoken about as wine. And I think Jesus will help us here. And so I'm going to insert this sermon for your benefit, for us to be on the same page so that I don't have to go back and repeat some of the themes that I bring up in this particular sermon. Just to give you a little heads up, I use some slides with my church when I'm sharing this sermon. You're not missing a lot. The first sign Uh, First slide I put up actually is of a bunch of street signs, which you could find if you just Google street signs. I just put an image up there, left turn, right turn, railroad crossing, those kinds of things, because my opening illustration is dependent upon that. And then later in there uh, as well, I put up the word significant. And for us in English to see the word significant, the first four letters of which are our word for sign, which John is telling us Jesus is communicating by the very miracle that he's performing in Cana. So as you're listening along, you won't be able to see what my congregation could see, but I trust that you are clever enough to still follow along with me without the visual aid. So that's all the introduction I'm going to offer for this episode. I offer to you the sermon, A Feast of Well-Aged Wine. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, open our eyes this morning so that we too might see your glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is official. The Yoders now have three licensed drivers in our household. Yes, a couple of weeks ago, Anna received her driver's license. Now, to get her driver's license, she had to take a driving test with an instructor. But to get her permit a number of months before and then to go on to drive 60 plus hours with Jessica and myself, in order to get that permit, she had to rightly identify the signs of the road, both what those signs look like as well as what they mean. It looked something like this. Now, you've all seen road signs like these. Um, Unfortunately, on the actual road, you don't have the helpful little titles underneath the signs telling you exactly what those signs mean. But signs are pointers toward real situations or circumstances that you might face on the road, but the signs themselves are not those things. Perhaps you've heard of the woman who called her local township office to request removing the deer crossing sign on her road. Her reason? Too many deer were being hit by cars and she didn't want them crossing there anymore. (laughs) 
Now, this woman, fictional or real, <laughs> rightly recognized what the deer crossing sign looked like, but she misunderstood what it meant. It's a funny story because we all know that signs like that aren't for deer. They are there to alert drivers to be on the lookout for deer. In order for road signs to be helpful, then, you have to understand what they are attempting to point you to. It's the same with Jesus' signs. In verse 11 of our passage this morning, John tells us that Jesus' turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana was the first of his signs, and he manifested his glory through it. Now, if signs are pointers toward real situations or circumstances, but are themselves not those things, then you and I need to be asking, what is Jesus' turning water into wine intending to point us to? We can look at this sign of his and recognize something special in it, but if we do not understand what it means, we'll be no better off than the woman thinking the deer crossing sign was meant for the deer. There's something far more significant going on in this narrative than just what's on the surface. So I'd like us to look at this narrative piece by piece and see if we can figure out what it's intending to communicate to us about Jesus. And so if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open it to John chapter 2. Near the very beginning of this narrative, we encounter five of the saddest words you ever want to hear at a wedding feast. When the wine ran out. <laughs> now, wedding feasts in the first century were supposed to last for seven days. They were huge celebrations, a time for family and friends to set aside all other responsibilities for an entire week just to rejoice with and for the new couple. All the arrangements would have already been made prior to the event, and it was the bridegroom's responsibility to make them. So running out of wine during the feast would not only potentially ruin the party, as it no doubt would ruin a party today, but would have been incredibly shameful for the bridegroom. It would have communicated to everyone that he hadn't made the necessary preparations or that he couldn't provide all that was needed for his guests. Either way, this is not the way you want to start out a marriage. A wedding feast ought to be one of life's most joyous occasions. Running out of wine may very well make it one of your biggest sorrows instead. I think many of us can put ourselves in the bridegroom's place. You've been waiting with anticipation for something for years, only to find out that the reality falls far short of your ideal. Real life doesn't always work out exactly as you'd hoped. Dreams are sometimes crushed. Circumstances don't materialize the way we imagined they would. It seems at times that the greater potential for joy there is in something, the greater the risk of disaster if everything doesn't work out just right. Running out of wine at your wedding feast more or less just sums up all of them. It's those times when life's joys are replaced with sorrow. Isaiah identifies this bitter reality as the covering that is cast over all peoples. There's something at work that casts a shadow over everything in this world, a veil that gets in the way. There seem to be forces constantly at work that make experiencing joy a real struggle and that seem to bring sorrow into our lives with ease. Sometimes this covering comes from unexplainable places. At other times, it clearly comes from ourselves. Sometimes the decisions we make negatively affect even our own lives, our choices distance ourselves from God and from one another, and it's as if we're trapped. No matter what we try, nothing seems to make things any better. A covering really is cast over all peoples, and it touches everything and everyone. Try as we might, there seems to be no way of escaping it. 
Now, the nation of Israel tried relentlessly to remove this covering through rites of purification. Their various washing rituals, cleansing procedures, and sacrifices were their daily attempt to maintain a joy-filled life of communion with God, which would enable them to experience his blessings. But even with countless purification rites, their lives never improved. Their life choices remain just as destructive with their sacrifices as without them. Try as they might, ritual washings did little to change things. Fascinatingly enough, it is six such water jars used for the Jewish rites of purification that Jesus asks for during the wedding feast. He tells the servants to fill all six jars up with water. Now, what jars filled with water were going to contribute to this feast's lack of wine was anyone's guess, but the servants don't question Jesus. They simply do what he says. And John tells us in verse 7 that they filled them up to the brim. The servants fill these purification jars all the way up. They put everything into them that would fit. And considering what they represent, you could say that they put every rule, every guideline, every one of their Jewish rites of purification into those jars. The best that Judaism has to offer, the best that mankind can do to try to make himself clean was put into those jars, but none of it could bring any life to the party. It couldn't make anything better. Judaism, for all its good intentions, could not remove the covering that is cast over all peoples. It could not bring any lasting blessing. Something needs to be done to this water, to this broken system, that can bring real life to it, that can turn mankind's sorrow back into joy. Jesus, as we know, is about to do something with this purifying water, that only he can do. He's about to transform the water himself into the life of the party. Mary's and Jesus' interaction at the beginning of the narrative clues us into just what this something is. When Mary discovers that the wine had run out, she immediately tells Jesus, but her, his answer to her is rather strange. What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, this is the first time in John's gospel that the phrase, my hour, is found on the lips of Jesus, but it won't be the last. The clearest reference to his hour comes in chapter 12, and here's what Jesus says. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Here, Jesus unmistakably connects his hour to his impending death, highlighting for everyone the fruit that his death will bear for the world. But why on earth does Jesus cryptically refer to his death in response to his mother asking him to do something about the wine shortage problem? And why have a bunch of purification water jars filled to the brim in the process? And asking these kinds of questions, we're getting very close to the heart of this narrative. Very close, in fact, to the heart of the gospel itself. The Jewish rites of purification, any rite of purification for that matter, cannot bring about ultimate cleanliness. No amount of ritual sacrifice can purify the heart of any worshiper, regardless of who he is. Now, it wasn't because the washings and the rituals and the sacrifices themselves were insufficient. It's just that those offering them weren't themselves capable of bringing about lasting change through them. Jesus changes all of that himself. He has all the water jars for purification filled up completely, exhausting all of their potential, all of their power, all of their purpose, and then transforming it all himself into something that will last that will break through the covering, that will put an end to all sorrow once and for all. 
The author to the Hebrews reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus knows this. And he wants us to see the connection between his death, his hour, and the Jewish rites of purification. He fills up all of these rites himself to the brim and transforms them into life-giving wine by shedding his own blood to provide the solution. Where the purification rites themselves bring nothing but sorrow, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' hour takes him to the cross, to the place where the glory of God, his deep love for wayward sinners, is put most fully on display. And when he does, he takes on not just the covering that is cast over all peoples, but even death itself. Listen as I read the larger passage from Isaiah 25 that speaks of the covering and see if it sounds at all like this wedding feast scene in Cana. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now this sounds like one of the most hope-filled celebratory times in all the world. And it looks as if the Lord himself is bringing for all peoples his feast of aged wine well refined right here in Cana. But notice that the only way for such a promise to truly bring joy, the greatest covering of all will need to be dealt with. Death. Death by far is the greatest bringer of sorrow our world has ever known. But look at verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. And how is it that the Lord is going to do that? The answer is actually given in the first four words of our narrative from John chapter 2. On the third day. Right from the very beginning then, John has given us the clue we needed to make sense of this entire story. Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. God brought Jesus to new life on the third day. Jesus defeated death on the third day. On the third day, he brings life out of death. He lifts the covering that is cast over all peoples and he brings joy out of sorrow, particularly for the bridegroom. By saving the best wine for last, Jesus lifts everyone's spirits, literally. But notice, it's the bridegroom's honor that is preserved by the miracle. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, he doesn't thank the servants or even ask where the wine came from. Instead, we're told in verse 8, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. The master of the feast goes straight to the bridegroom and praises him for this pleasant turn of events. So the bridegroom is now the one who not only isn't shamed for having run out of wine, but is seen as the greatest of all wedding hosts for saving the best wine for last. And why would Jesus be interested in preserving the honor of a bridegroom, you ask? Well, because that's who he is. He's the bridegroom. And the wedding he's preparing is what all other weddings are merely a picture of. 
John the Baptist says one chapter later, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. John claims to be that friend. The friend sent merely to bear witness to the God who has come to save us. To bear witness to the Lord of hosts who will make for all peoples a feast of well-aged wine. To bear witness to the one who will swallow up not only the covering, but also death itself by shedding his own blood for us on a cross. And that's the sign that on the third day, Jesus saves the honor of the bridegroom by filling up in himself the covering that is cast over all peoples as well as mankind's purification attempts to remove that covering. And he alone transforms it into more than enough of the best tasting wine to satisfy all of his wedding guests. His own honor is what's at stake and he's provided more than enough wine for every conceivable person who wishes to attend his wedding feast. Do you see the sign? Do you understand what it means? And can you, like the disciples, see Jesus' glory in it? Remember, signs are pointers toward real situations or circumstances, but are themselves not those things. Jesus' glory was not visible to all who had seen the miracle. The glory can't be identified simply with the miraculous display. The eyes of faith have to take you beyond the sign to what the sign is pointing you to. This sign is pointing us to our bridegroom who provided all his wedding guests a feast of well-aged wine by shedding his own blood for them on a cross. That is what the sign means. And all those who participate in his blood are welcome to attend his wedding feast. Hallelujah, we read in Revelation 19. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. No wonder Jesus will soon say to his disciples a word that he could very easily still say to us. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Amen.